Welcome to Green Money Matters, the podcast where your financial future meets the planet's well-being, bringing you the latest on climate issues and uncovering new and exciting investment opportunities that make a positive impact. And I'm Chris Everett, your guide to sustainable investing, ESG funds and all things green. Each week, we'll explore the intersection of money and sustainability, showing you how investing wisely can create a greener world and grow your money. From renewable energy projects to eco-friendly startups, we'll dive deep into the companies and funds that are driving change and making a difference. Whether you're a seasoned investor or just starting your journey, Green Money Matters is here to empower you with knowledge, insights and actionable tips that'll supercharge your portfolio and make a positive impact on the planet. Join me as I speak with industry experts, successful investors and thought leaders who are shaping the future of sustainable finance. So get ready to invest with a conscience and join the growing movement of individuals who are reshaping the financial landscape. Welcome to Green Money Matters with your host, Chris Everett. Hello and welcome to Green Money Matters. Today, we're going to be speaking to Franz Hochstrasse, who's the CEO of Raise Green. Raise Green is a marketplace for impact investing and climate solutions. Often on the show, we talk about the different investment opportunities that are provided by, you know, wonderful, innovative solutions to the climate crisis. Some of those investments are through major companies on major indices, through ETFs, through green bonds, and so on. Well, what about if you want to get involved at the ground floor? What about if you're really interested in helping some of the the really innovative, cutting edge entrepreneurs that are just starting out? Um, maybe they're just starting out. Maybe they need a bit of a leg up. Um, you know, maybe they're you know just going to be the next big thing, a real investment opportunity, as well as making great inroads into helping mitigate some of the worst effects of the climate crisis. Whether it's for you know new solar farms, water reuse systems, um, maybe even geothermal power installations or bioplastics, um, raise green, and as we'll shortly find out, I trust, um, gives us some really interesting new opportunities to make investment decisions, make investment motives, um, make investments full stop into innovative climate solutions. Right, so let's get into this and welcome today's guest all the way from Boston, Massachusetts. It's Raise Green's Franz Hochstrasse. Franz Hochstrasse, welcome. Uh, uh, thank you so much, Chris. Great to be here with you. Glad you're here. Um, yes, um, Franz is um, the CEO and co-founder of Raise Green, um, the investment marketplace platform for climate companies, really. Um, but Franz, I'd really love to hear your introduction. Tell us a bit about yourself. Tell us about Raise Green. What- well, yes. Thank you, Chris. Um, so Raise Green is a climate investment platform, is what we call it. Uh, and it and it is really a place for anybody who wants to invest either their time or their money into solving the climate crisis. Uh, So we look at the, the, you know, the massive heat waves across the world at the moment that are catching attention of the wildfire smoke that's polluting the air in, uh, in most of the Northeast in the U S we look at, you know, the 19 days in a row where we've had above 110 degree Fahrenheit temperatures in, in Arizona and, We have seen these impacts uh, for years. I've been working on climate for 15 years. And increasingly, as as they hit more and more populations, people are asking, what can I do about this? Uh, What can I, as an individual, do? Hmm. Uh, And ultimately, Raise Green is a place for anyone to take individual action that leads to collective action. So it's a crowd investment marketplace where you can go on and find uh, companies that are building uh, clean energy projects in inner city Baltimore. You can find uh, early stage startup ventures that are you know, building breakthrough technologies that are going to be necessary to decarbonize 
you know, the harder to abate sectors like aviation and industry. And, um, and then you can find, uh, you know, everyday green bonds, like uh, what the Connecticut Green Bank sells for as little as a hundred dollars. Anybody can put money into it um, and own a piece of that clean energy infrastructure that we need to build. Well, that's outstanding. Um, so who are your users typically? Um, so we have, we have two types of users. Uh, we have issuers who are you know, raising capital and we work with them to bring their projects from being investment worthy, as we say, to investment ready. So we give them uh, tools in the form of templates and advice and guidance to structure a securities offering under Regulation CF in the U.S. Uh, and sell it to the crowd uh, and also market it to the crowd. So everything from origination to underwriting to uh, capital formation on that front. And then um, for the investors, uh, you know, it's everything from students putting in $100 uh, to professional investors, family offices, CDFIs, uh, putting in hundreds of thousands uh, of dollars into individual deals. Uh, so it's a, it's a really broad range. We have 22,000 members. We've done uh, 27 deals to date since launching in 2020. Uh, mm -hmm. And uh, we've raised over $7 million now through the marketplace uh, into community scale climate solutions. That's outstanding. I, I mean, how did, how, did you, how did you start? What brought you to this? You know, what excited you about it? Why and, you know, why did you start? Yeah, well, so I, you know, I um, actually got my start as a field organizer for President Obama mm -hmm. uh, back on his 2008 campaign uh, for the White House. And I came out of undergrad thinking, you know, politics and big structural change was the thing that had to happen. Um very starry-eyed and hope-filled and got the opportunity to work on that campaign, which really was transformational for me. Um, and, and afterward, uh, rode that wave to Washington, D.C. Um, so I spent uh, my 20s uh, in the government working at the U.S. Department of Agriculture on food security, climate, energy, conservation, um, open data, uh, and then at the White House Council on Environmental Quality working on the president's climate action plan. Um, and, and then lastly, at the U.S. State Department, helping to negotiate the Paris Agreement as part of the uh, U, uh, Special Envoy for Climate Change team there. And so I came away from all of that, like really high level climate work with two main motivations. Uh, one being, we need more people involved in tackling the crisis. We need talent and energy from every sector of the economy working on this because we have to transition, you know, the entire economy effectively yeah. uh, to, to be successful in our lifetimes. Um, and then also we just need so much more capital. Uh, at the time, you know, there was about 300 billion a year globally flowing into clean energy and climate solutions. Uh, last year, the estimate now is that it was 1.1 trillion. So, the money is coming, but it has to be in the range of, you know, four and a half to five trillion dollars per year uh, from 2030 to mid-century to really deploy enough of these new technologies to replace the, you know, fossil fuel emitting and polluting technologies. Um, so I looked at those problems in grad school, crunched numbers, did research, learned finance and said, all right, let's put... Um, the people together with the capital and make projects happen. Um, so, the, you know, that was the origin, really. Amazing story, really inspirational. Um, I mean, well, well done. I mean, <laughs> what, 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 a, what, a, what a time to be, you know, at the right place in the right time. Um, so, I what was do you? Lucky. <laughs> I think you're being uh, generous. <laughs> um, so. What do you think are the most pressing problems facing the world today? Um, and how can, how can investors um, help mitigate some of those problems, help alleviate some of those problems? What can we do? Boy, yeah, uh, the big question. Um, yeah, I've been going through the, the Thomas Piketty books that I, I wasn't able to read as a, uh, yeah, as a, a government worker. Um, and so, you know, I do think wealth inequality is something that is 
further exacerbating by the day, by, you know, by the year. Um, but at the same time, I mean, my career really has been dedicated to and, and focused on addressing the climate crisis, uh, because to me, that is, um, you know, the singular thing that threatens our uh, humanity's ongoing, you know, status quo and existence on the planet. Um, and so those two problems together, I think, are the most pernicious at the moment. Certainly, you know, war and conflict um, is fueled by, by both of those, but, and, and can be more acute in terms of, you know, the, the impacts and the urgency to address it. But um, yeah, to me, those are, those are hugely uh, critical challenges to solve. They are uniquely kind of solvable in our, in our lifetimes, I think. And if we solve both at once, in other words, like if we ad- address and, and uh, rapidly decarbonize and transition our economy from high emitting sources to low carbon, uh, that's going to create an explosion in wealth and, uh, and uh, economic growth. And that can be a mechanism for pulling the, the kind of uh, levers of history toward a more equal society and more equal distribution of wealth as well. So, you know, one good example is the Justice 40 initiative that President Biden has launched, which says, look, of this record, you know, massive investment in clean energy and climate that is coming through the Inflation Reduction Act, through the Bipartisan Infrastructure Law, through the Chips and Science Act, um, 40% of the benefits of that federal investment need to go to underserved or historically disadvantaged populations or communities. Um, And that's that's something that we believe deeply in, that we work on every day at Raise Green, and that, uh, that investors, frankly, have an opportunity to uh, to get in on early and to benefit from in the in the medium to long term. Um, it just takes patience and, and dedication and uh, foresight. I think I love your positivity, um, and I, I love the actions you're taking and what motivates you. Um, are you are you optimistic? Are you optimistic that um, we as a you know as a world as a society can make the changes before the very worst of the climate crisis impacts us all? Yeah, inherently, I'm, I am optimistic. Um, I think you have to be to work in this space, because uh, <laughs> the al- the alternative is to sort of put your head down like an ostrich and ignore it until it bites you. But the mm. reality also is that it's biting all of us now, whether we're seeing it on a day-to-day or not. Um, so, you know, the, there are some stats like that, uh, basically, you know, 91% of human adults have a smartphone within arm's reach uh, every hour of every day of their waking lives. Uh, so if we simply empower adults with the opportunity to make decisions that uh, can can go toward some of you know addressing these challenges, make it as easy as possible, you know, uh, and and also make it economically beneficial because if you invest in stuff that pays back over time, you know, you're also building your your wealth. Um, then yeah, I, I believe that we can align those motivations and we can tackle giant challenges. Uh, both in the U.S. as a country, and then you know globally um, through co- cooperation, coordination, and multilateral dialogues, uh, which I of course believe deeply in, having worked on uh, the Paris Agreement with colleagues from around the world. Yes, excellent. So, in, in real terms, um, tell us how how Raise Green um, gives investors an opportunity to you know, promote social and um, environmental impacts. Certainly. So, you know, I'll take a couple examples. One, one is uh, one we're, we're very, very proud of um, having worked on this project for about two years with a partner, um, and it's the Climate Access Fund. Uh, they just closed uh, a raise for $370,000. They oversubscribed it by about $50,000. 
and it is for a community solar project on the rooftop of an inner city high school in Baltimore, Maryland. Um, it is 100% low to moderate income customers. So those customers get a 25% discount off of their electricity bills that sign up to buy the electricity. Um, and the investors, you know, get uh, a 5.5% return um, over the next 15 years for the, you know, for the price of having bought into that deal. Um, this is run by uh, one of the green banks in the, in the country. So Climate Access Fund is part of the Coalition for Green Capital, uh, which, you know, uh, means that they also, because they're a nonprofit, qualify for the direct pay credits, which are a result of the Inflation Reduction Act. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, using that, uh, those new mechanisms of a, a rapidly emerging and growing uh, economic shift to benefit a greater population uh, that, you know, frankly needs it the most because they're, they're the, uh, you know, low and, and moderate income. Um, so that's one very clear example of where you can create returns. You can also create social benefit um, and savings for end users, and you can create clean energy while you're at it. Um, and you know, reduce the emissions intensity of the grid. That's that's fantastic. So, um, I mean, just just uh, how, how many investors do you have um, on this 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 solar project? Uh, yeah, this one, uh, I think we closed with about seventy five investors. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, historically, on average, folks invest around four thousand dollars on the marketplace. Mm -hmm. uh, we have a really strong. Uh, uh, ratio of folks who commit to multiple offerings. So about 70% of people after making a first investment will come back and make another one, uh, which is, which is excellent. Um, and we also have a very high conversion rate of people who get to our site to raisegreen.com uh, to those that actually invest. Um, it's about four times higher than normal e-commerce uh, websites. And why is uh, that? Well, I, I think it's because we attract a mission driven group. You know, we, it is a community of, of like minded folks that find each other on, on the Raise Green platform. Um, and a lot of folks who, uh, you know, have, a, have applied to raise capital also come back and invest in other people's projects. Uh, and some of our investors are super loyal and have invested in every deal that we've done. Uh, and you know, the, the community itself has to, uh, you know, organize and, and galvanize around things that it wants to see happen. And a big part of what, why we exist is to give the tool of capital formation to anybody who wants to, to seize it effectively. And, and how, how do you cultivate that sense of community? Um, well, you know, it, it has evolved. Um, I've been working on this for five years. Mm -hmm. um, so it's, it's been a grind, but it comes together, I think, through uh, concerted effort as well of you know, creating the space. So we, we do investor days uh, every couple of months where you can actually engage with the entrepreneur raising the money. You can ask them questions. Uh, we do uh, a referral bonus. So, you know, Chris, if you referred one of your friends and they made an investment, then you get a little bit of a, a kickback. Um, off of that, um, we, we have an impact partners program that we're going to do a second cohort of. Uh, so this is anybody who wants to basically volunteer and step up and say, hey, I want to help raise green grow. I got my skills. You know, we have people in there who are producers, somebody who's you know producing an event for us uh, next month. Um, we have people in there who are venture capitalists who are sending us deals and saying, hey, these guys might benefit from your services. Um, we have professional investors. We have graduate students who are, you know, trying to learn or develop their own entrepreneurial uh, climate tech venture, um, and and so we benefit a lot from that synergy too. Oh, that's excellent. That's excellent. I mean, I mean how how big a team are you at Race Green? Um, it's it's a nimble group. Um, so we're eight right now, uh, and and we we try to pull in. Uh, a lot of help from advisors as well, because 
uh, you know, so much of trying to organize a market network is the network, right? The marketplace is, uh, is there because we have to be able to transact. And as an SEC and FINRA registered marketplace, uh, we're proud to be able to offer that service. But it's what happens around the outside of it and the variability, the strength of the marketplace and the, and the strength of the connections that get built through the transactions and through the partnership um, is, you know, I think where, where the real prize is. I mean, tr- transparency and trust are, you know, are really sort of critical to, to these sorts of ventures. Um, how do you make sure that, um, uh, that your investments um, and, you know, those raising money within your site um, are truly aligned with sustainable objectives? Yeah, well, um, you, we, we do have a fairly rigorous um, diligence process. Uh, we call it, we use the raise model, uh, which is revenue, um, ambition in the team, uh, impact uh, that's that's both social and environmentally demonstrable. And so we have, you know, we have, we have scores around that, that we're using to evaluate um, every every project that comes through at this point. Um, and so, uh, you know, the, the reality is that you've got, um, we've had about 450, well, more than 450 applications at this point, we've listed 27. So mm-hmm. it's a, it's a, you know, strong uh, funnel. And uh, we, we, you know, even though we can't give financial, legal, or accounting or tax advice, um, we take it upon ourselves to ensure that what we're putting onto the marketplace, we we have conviction in and we believe in. Um, and so we vetted those deals. And, um, you know, we have uh, my own background in climate. Um, we have my chief investment officer has 20 plus years in capital markets. Uh, she joined us after leaving Goldman Sachs. Um, so she she brings a degree of rigor and compliance that uh, I think is is second to none. Um, and then we have a really dedicated team of uh, of folks that you know have now worked in climate for several years themselves, and and we look critically at it. We're part of the partnership for carbon accounting and financials, um, so we're working on you know those methodologies that are also being applied by BlackRock and. Vanguard, some of the biggest, you know, financial firms in the industry, and we're we're the smallest by about ten times. And that's a part of that group. <laughs> okay, brilliant. What's the normal sort of time scale, firstly, from you know, from a, um, a, an investment opportunity being being launched on Raise Green, and you know, generating interest to you know actually being there, the project or company actually being funded and and launched. Was there an average sort of time scale for that? Yeah, uh, soup to nuts. Uh, usually, the sales process or like the you know consideration process um, can take a few weeks. Where people do you know they submit a welcome survey, they submit an intake form. Uh, we do a call with them, and then we run a investment committee process internally to select the deals that we're going to move forward. Once that's done, uh, um, then it takes between a month and six weeks. You know, four to six weeks to actually prepare the offering memorandum and uh, offering page and the security, um, either debt or equity. And we've sold you know a whole variety of those, so we have templates for all of them. But that process, you know, it's, it's serious preparation, serious diligence, um, getting all of our ducks in a row, uh, and then filing with the Securities and Exchange Commission to turn the raise live. Um, so we're talking four to six weeks there. Um, the raise period itself, the capital formation period, has to be a minimum of 21 days. Usually, it's about 60 days, uh, and then on the back end, there's about a week uh, to settle up the transactions and get the payment out. So, you know, in total, you're you're talking, uh, you know, any anywhere from basically uh, 45 days to, you know, uh, four four months in the in the most complex cases. Hmm. Yeah, no, understood. Um, and in terms of the investments, you, you mentioned the solar project, which is you know effectively a green bond, if I understand it correctly. Um, and you also have um, equity um, equity opportunities as well. 
Yeah. Um, so at this stage, you know, we have done everything from a one year green bond certified offering um, that pays out sort of, you know, akin to a treasury. You know, it's a, it's a one year cycle um, to you know, three year debt, uh, five year debt, 12 year debt, 15 year debt. Um, and those all have different tenors and maturities. And of course, we track, you know, interest rate movements, which have been dramatic recently. Uh, but thankfully, you know, that that yield curve, I think, is starting to uh, re- uh, correct itself uh, optimistically again. But um, <laughs> not in the UK, it isn't. <laughs> <laughs> right. Um, but but the, and then we also do sell equity offerings. Uh, so we do simple agreements for future equity, convertible notes, preferred equity. We've even uh, sold one instance of common equity. Um, as well, but we typically don't like to uh, consider ourselves like a mini IPO because you know selling common equity should be something that happens down the line uh, once you have a price sec- price security because you've done a price round as a startup uh, or as a as a more mature business. Okay, yeah, no, understood. Um, and what sort of challenges have you faced in um, promoting sustainable finance? Well, uh, you know, we're definitely getting some headwinds at the moment in the U.S. Uh, there's a, a kind of uh, double movement, uh, to use a Carl Polanyi, you know, political theorist t- term, where ESG just exploded onto the scene in 2020, 2021. You know, post, uh, you know, the the rise of Black Lives Matter um, after the, uh, George Floyd's killing. Mm. Um, I think really catapulted ESG to the forefront of considerations for corporates and, and, and financial services. Um, and so, and then you've seen now as a result, like a little bit of a pushback from the political right, particularly in the U S uh, where you're getting these local bills banning uh, use the use of ESG data or information in financial decision-making, which, you know, is, deeply counterintuitive to someone like me who says, look, let's, let's put all the facts on the table. Let's get all the data out there and use more information to m- make informed investment decisions uh, as opposed to saying, no, that stuff doesn't matter. Uh, uh, so uh, that's been interesting. There, there's some fascinating work done by uh, those analyzing the pushback in the U S finding yeah, that pension pensioners, particularly in, in, in Indiana, uh, based on the anti-ESG bill that, that passed there, could stand to lose about $6.7 billion in returns uh, over the coming years as a result of that bill. Uh, so wow. there are definite headwinds, but I think at the end of the day, as, you're, you, know, as you touched on earlier, uh, you know, op- optimism is abound in those that uh, consider science and consider uh, additional data and information as an important source of decision making. And so I I think we're uh, going to push through some of that opposition. Oh, good. I mean, it's, you know, it's, it's, Certainly, something I was going to ask you about. You know, someone that's um, had such a great deal of experience um, in politics and negotiating. Um, you know, how we how do we counter the you know this anti woke investing you know movement or lobby? You know, is this just a sort of a populist bubble that's going to pop at a certain stage, or you know, do we have to be you know more aggressive in dealing with it? What, what's what is the answer to this? Is there one? Yeah, um, you know, I don't know the answer. I know I have an answer, <laughs> but um, you know, I, I think it's one of in capital markets. You know, alpha speaks the loudest, and it, you know, depending on whose analysis you're looking at, um, returns do tend to outperform if you have greater visibility into more aspects of a company. Um, and so, you know, you see some of these ESG indexes perform better uh, than, than you do, you know, the, the normal benchmarks. Um, and then in certain instances, they don't. And it's like, oh, well, you know, there, there's an example of why we shouldn't be doing it. Um, but on, on net, I think, um, and again, without getting into financial advice, I think that the market ultimately is going to kind of... Uh, 
stamp out a lot of the politically motivated opposition to incorporating ESG data and information into decision makers, decision making for investments. Um, I think that will be additionally uh, buttressed by the Securities and Exchange Commission's um, uh, ESG rules. Um, so the climate related risk disclosure rules are in the making. There's been a comment period where they had a record number of comments come in. Uh, the EU already has a taxonomy around uh, you know, green or sustainable investing that is in use. And, um, and in the U.S., you know, we're, we're working to catch up. Uh, thankfully, now there's also an International Sustainability Standards Board uh, kind of benchmark as well for what should be considered in material to uh, material as, as risk for financial decisions. And I think that harmonization, this is a very new uh, understanding ultimately among the financial services industry that climate risk is financial risk yeah. and that, yeah. you know, it needs to be incorporated and it's just how to do that is what we're going through right now. Yeah. No, I fundamentally agree on, um, on all those points, Franz. Um, inclusivity um, is uh, an essential aspect of um, sustainability. How does your platform ensure that there's a diverse range of investors um, you know, representing, you know, different communities, different regions? Can you do um, that? Yeah, I, I love this question. Um, you know, <laughs> a big piece of, again, trying to tackle those those two grand challenges of, you know, wealth and income inequality and, uh, and the climate crisis at once, a rapid decarbonization and proliferation of climate solutions. Um, you know, nine out of 10 Americans in the U.S. Uh, prior to really 2016 um, and after the Great Depression when these Securities and Exchange and the Securities and, and, the, and the Securities Act passed. Um, so for a hundred years, nine out of ten Americans didn't have access to private investment opportunities. Effectively, yeah. um, so, you know they they could invest in publicly traded stocks and bonds, um, but not venture deals, not um, project finance at the you know at any scale generally, um, and so. When the 2012 Jobs Act passed, uh, which President Obama signed into law, and then in 2016, with the finalization of the regulation crowdfunding rules, uh, suddenly, as long as you're doing it through a authorized funding portal like Raise Green, you can actually invest as a non-accredited investor into private deals. Uh, Raise Green specifically has cornered that market of, look, we are doing that for climate solution projects both project finance companies and climate tech uh, startups. And so that access alone creates a democratizing uh, force uh, that allows folks to put in a hundred bucks and to get a share of a private deal. Um, you know, on the equity side, it's risky. There's a lot of risk involved in doing venture investing and angel investing. Um, but even just having the opportunity, the, you know, the, the access to get into deals um, is is a, a force, I think, for uh, you know, for good. That's really interesting, and, I, and I'm you know, I back your um, the access to to equity um, and and how that's you know very democratizing. How do you ensure that projects um, seeking funding are really accessible and representative of you know different communities, um, different regions? Not, not everyone has the um, has the vocabulary. Um, how, how do you how do you give everyone access to investors? Yeah, again, love this love this question uh, because it's so core to what we're doing. Um, you know, finance is a is a language, right? It's a, it's a literacy. Um, can you speak about equity and debt and know the difference? Can you know, can you talk about terms and duration and you know, rates of return and um, and business models and those types of things. And a big part of what we're doing in, in opening up the access to the investors is the, a, a financial literacy opportunity. Learn about what securities types are. Learn about the business types. Learn about the variability in climate technologies that are needed to tackle this, this crisis from a whole economy standpoint. Um, but 
historically as well, you know, again, it, to access um, venture capitalists um, have invested in uh, black founders at a rate of, you know, at or around 1% uh, of the deals that they do. Um, they've invested in women founders at, at or around a rate of like 2 to 3%. And so that's woefully, you know, inadequate to enable those types of uh, entrepreneurs to have access to capital and to grow their businesses and to bring a more diverse array of companies to, uh, you know, to bear on, on the larger economy. So at Raise Green, we've uh, had more than half of the funding that's raised through our marketplace go to BIPOC or women founders, um, which is more than 10 times the average of the venture capital industry. Um, so, and, and, you know, we, we uh, pride ourselves on that, like I said, on the Justice 40 front, uh, because diversity in solutions, I mean, communities are best suited to, uh, you know, come up with the solutions that they, that they need. And if we can give them the ability to also raise capital for those solutions and get them deployed, um, you know, that creates a greater degree of resilience to these problems at a, at a societal level. What's, what's your vision for, for Raise Green? You know, we've got a lot of work to do, never mind 2050, 2020, 2030. I mean, let's stay, stay within this generation. Um, what's, what's your vision? Where, where, are you, where are you wanting to take this? Well, you know, we want to be the largest and most inclusive uh, climate investing community in the world. Uh, we're building toward that. Um, and, and I think that means having a greater diversity of project and, and uh, offering types on the marketplace. Um, you know, can, can we sell carbon credits? You know, can we open up uh, access to uh, municipalities and other types of issuers that might not use uh, retail investment as, as a source of, um, of capital uh, to, again, open up the access and to also demonstrate that we are uh, we're able to uh, provide the things that that the community needs where it's needed. Uh, so you know, people, places, and projects are what needs to happen, or what what need to be motivated and and delivered in our, in my lifetime, in our lifetimes, you know, to tackle the climate crisis. And we we want to be that nexus, the go to place for anybody with an idea who wants to get their their idea or, or project funded and anybody who has a couple hundred bucks or a couple hundred thousand or a couple billion bucks that they want to invest in um, the clean energy transition. Now you're, you're very much um, obviously focused on, on the, the North American or the United States market. Um, you know, are you going to expand? What's the plan that you're going to franchise? How does, how, how is, how are you expecting this, this story to roll out? Sure. We've, you know, we've seen the emergence of uh, green crowdfunding or, you know, climate focused crowdfunding in the, in the EU actually be quite successful. Um, there's a great precedent for Raise Green in uh, a company called Lumo, which is a French business that actually got acquired by Societe Generale um, and is still in operations that funds community scale, clean energy, solar and wind um, through community financing. Um, and so, and then there's a handful of others, and we actually have a partnership with one of the larger EU funding portals uh, to create that cross-border, you know, across Atlantic collaboration. Um, and then there are a couple other examples of folks that are doing this globally, because you know the North-South divide in the climate negotiations um, about you know provision of finance. Um, speed and scale of deployment of, of climate solutions has been the largest sticking point, frankly, in, in the global effort to tackle the crisis, you know, meaningfully and, and to deliver against nationally determined contributions for those developing countries um, historically. So if we can play a role in breaking down some of that by saying, hey, capital should flow more freely um, to where it's needed. And that is both in the form of, you know, those entrepreneurs and developers raising their hand and saying, I've got a project, um, you know, in sub-Saharan Africa that, that needs capital. And, you know, having somebody from 
Singapore or you know, Burundi or, or, uh, or Brunei uh, raise their hand and say, yeah, I, I'll put a, you know, some capital into it. Um, that would be really awesome. Uh, I think it, I think it's a, achievable. Uh, we worked on an open source version of this software back at the Yale Open Labs um, in partnership with uh, Dr. Martin Weinstein, who actually now runs the um, uh, Open Earth Foundation. And so that dream is still kind of out there, but uh, I think it's it's going to take uh, greater coordination and and uh, concerted effort, but. There's no reason why this model shouldn't be proliferated across the world and, and utilized, whether it's through Raise Green or simply uh, through local crowd investment platforms uh, to to drive you know faster and more inclusive uh, transition. Just just to stay, take a step back again, so you know you've you've got a um, an investment um, or a project um, being launched. Subsequent to subsequent to, to to the launch of the project or the um, or the company, um, is there is there any follow up from Raise Green? You know, to continue monitoring, perhaps even supporting the project or the investors. Yeah, absolutely. Um, we we wouldn't just send people on their way and say, you know, good luck. Um, we we certainly have a vested interest in uh, all of the the deals that raise capital on our marketplace succeeding, um, and so that that kind of comes in the form, a couple forms. One is that, you know, the bulk of our uh, fee on a deal actually is a success fee. So it doesn't get paid unless we've successfully raised the money with the company um, in, in the offering. Um, and then on the back end, there is a reporting requirement for uh, companies that use regulation crowdfunding to one year hence uh, file an annual report that updates the investors. Um, naturally, if they're borrowing, it's a debt offering. Um, there's a you know there's an obligation of the company to repay those investors, and so we um, certainly check in on that and help monitor that for our for the investor base. Um, we're in the process of putting together the ability to actually simplify that repayment system through the marketplace, so that folks don't have to. Um, do that themselves, uh, but when we have a couple of immediate uh, solutions to that now already, um, but but yeah, you know the the down the line, I think, and as as these projects continue to proliferate, we're going to have more opportunities to draw on the the impact metrics and and get reporting out of you know the companies where the money has gone, and also. Uh, what it's done, you know, what it's helped accomplish. So stay tuned on on more uh, on that front. <laughs> okay, excellent. Um, I, well, tell me a little bit about um, the most interesting technologies that you've seen come on in the last you know, the last few years since you've been operating. Um, yeah, let me let me think. So one one that I'm, I love as a story um, and has been immensely successful. Uh, from what we've seen thus far, um, is is this company Ola Filter that did their pre-seed round on Raise Green, and they uh, they make a tap water filter that's about you know three inches tall, and uh, a circular thing that screws right onto the uh, the tap of you know any any uh, uh, you know water source really, and de- and this filters out uh, a 99 something percent of the of the pollutants in that water. So this is being used in in Latin America and the developing world already, um, and it, it's a really cool success story. I love the technology; is really um, you know nimble. Um, it's also now being you know they're marketing to backpackers and folks you know who who need water filtration um, in that What's manner. What's the com- Oh, sorry, what's the company called again? Oil Filter? No. Uh, it's called Ola Filter. Ola Filter. Ola, yeah, O-L-A, yeah. Excellent. Um, so they're, they're, they're sort of an alumni of the platform. Um, you know, the and then an, another one that just finished a raise with us and that is a really exciting company uh, is Applied Bioplastics. Uh, they have come up with a biopolymer that, can effectively, it's a drop-in replacement for plastics 
uh, or, or for, for a chunk of the biomass that's used to create plastics. Um, and it reduces the outcome of, you know, the, the intensity of uh, the emissions involved in the plastics production process by about 40%. Um, so it's very considerable and it's, uh, they have, you know, all of the, all of the reasons lined up to succeed a really awesome team. We worked with them at, uh, out of Greentown Labs as well, where we're a member too. Um, so those are a couple that, that I'm excited about. I'm trying to avoid talking about raises that are currently live because I can't uh, put, my, put my thumb on the scale uh, on the, the newer <laughs> breakthrough technologies. No, I appreciate that. Now, of course. Um, now, for um, individuals or organizations that are interested in impact investing, um, what advice would you give them? How can they get directly involved through your crowdfunding platform? Well, thanks, Chris, for that question. I have to be a little careful because I can't give advice. Uh, what I would say, though, is you know, uh, use use the investment opportunities as a as a way to learn. Uh, ask questions. You know, we have a forum on the marketplace where you can ask a question of any of the companies, um, and they, you know, are very responsive. Um, so, you know, read the offering memorandum, read the offering page. You know, don't just watch the video and make decisions, um, because there's a lot. There's a lot in there, and um, you know, if you w- one stat that we lift up often at Raise Green is that. Historically, uh, for every hundred dollars invested through the marketplace, we've been able to catalyze about eleven hundred pounds of CO two emissions avoidance or reductions, um, and so that that adds up. Um, it it really does, and you know, one of the kind of driving forces from my research in grad school that helped for that pushed me into starting the business was a a paper. Uh, that I read called Beyond Returns, where it basically evaluated of all of the interventions in the financial sector, you know, how can you make the greatest impact with your money? And it, it broke it down into two effective options. One was, you know, owning shares of large publicly traded companies and voting your shares as a shareholder advocate or proxy vote. Um, and, and the other was allocating capital into inefficient markets. So places where it's difficult to raise money, um, if you put money into those places, that's going to move the dial um, meaningfully. And so that's really the side of the uh, impact investment thesis that we clutched onto and said, let's allocate capital where it's needed and where it's not going. Uh, So that's something to think about as you're evaluating options. Yeah, and, and large on that for me. So um, investing in inefficient markets, help me with that. <laughs> yeah, um, basically, you know, publicly traded uh, stocks or bonds um, highly, are highly efficient, you know, highly liquid. So when you want to sell um, a share of, uh, you know, GM, uh, you know that there's hundreds of thousands of of orders out there on the order book. So there's a, you know, a price to uh, a bid and an ask, and there's no difficulty, even if, even if that stock is dropping precipitously uh, in finding liquidity for it, uh, because it's, it's effectively, there's always interest on both sides to buy and sell. So that's an efficient market um, Mm. or, you know, a version of one. Um, an inefficient market would be where it's illiquid, so you don't have that, uh, you know, you don't have a ready order book of option of, um, of bids and asks looking to make a transaction happen. And instead you have um, an, a, a bid out there uh, or an ask out there that kind of sits around and waits for you know, or, or is, is even desperately trying to find somewhere to place that, that investment or to take, take investment. So that's a very inefficient market. And so, you know, commercial and industrial scale solar, for example, uh, when we started the business five years ago was highly inefficient because the soft costs are are quite high and it was really difficult to get bank financing. Uh, A lot of companies have innovated into that space and made it a much more efficient market. 
ourselves included. Um, but that's still always the case with startups as well, because, you know, they inevitably need capital and, uh, you know, it's, it's not, it's, there's a limited amount of investment dollars out there to go to those, uh, those technologies. Well, I, 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 huge admirer of what you do um i think um i think there's some really exciting things happening there i've i've been on the site a lot and uh, i've played 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 around with it and there's some really exciting opportunities out there and um yeah and i heartily um uh, encourage our listeners to uh, to go out there and um have a little play and uh, get involved it's a great community as well i think well that's a fantastic endorsement chris and yeah, the, the title of your podcast, Green Money Matters, re- resonates so deeply with Raise Green. Uh, you, we, we strongly believe that uh, you know, every little bit counts in this, uh, in this race to address the climate crisis and to deploy the solutions faster than the pace of the problem. Uh, so drawing everyone off the sidelines and getting in the game of, hey, let's not just suffer the consequences of you know, this advancing crisis, the heat waves, the, you know, the air pollution, the wildfires, the droughts, the floods, let's get ahead of it and let's invest in the solution set that uh, can help us pull out of it in our lifetime. So I very much appreciate you spending some time letting me come on and, and, and rant. Um, and uh, it's great to get to know you. <laughs> you too, Francis. It's not been a rant. It's been an inspiration. Thank you so much. Cool. My pleasure. And that wraps up another episode of Green Money Matters. We hope you're feeling inspired to take your investments to new green heights. Remember, it's not just about the bottom line anymore. By aligning your investments with sustainable values, you have the power to shape a better future for generations to come. If you enjoyed today's episode, be sure to subscribe to Green Money Matters on your favorite podcast platform and never miss an opportunity to grow your wealth sustainably. Together, let's make money matter for the planet. And don't forget to leave us a review. We really would love to hear your thoughts or ideas for future episodes. Drop me a line by email at chris at greenmoneymatters.com. Stay tuned for our next exciting episode where we'll explore groundbreaking investment opportunities and unveil the secrets of successful, sustainable investors. Until then, remember, green money matters because investing in our planet's future is the smartest investment choice you can make. Thank you for joining us. Until next time, goodbye. Goodbye.